Chapter One of Seed Babies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Seed Babies by Margaret Warner Morley. Beans, Section One. Well, I never. Jack said that because all the beans he had planted were on top of the ground. Jack was only six years old and not very well acquainted with beans no wonder he was surprised to find them on top of the ground when he had tucked them so snugly out of sight in the brown earth only a few days before jack looked at his beans and began to get red in the face he looked a little as if he were going to cry when co comes i'll just punch him he said at last for who could have uncovered his beans but his brother co for co would rather tease than eat his dinner except when there was chocolate pudding for dessert Co's real name was Nicholas, but it took too long to say that, so Jack called him Co for short. Jack picked up a bean to replant it, and what do you think had happened? Something had, for it did not look as it did when he first put it in the ground. It had turned green to begin with. Jack had planted white beans. He knew they were white all through, for he had bitten a good many in two to see how they looked inside and now the coat on the outside that had stuck so tightly at first had peeled half off and the bean was green something more had happened a little white stem had come out of the bean and gone into the ground jack was so surprised at all this that he forgot he was angry at co and when his brother came up only told him to look Co tried to pick up a bean too, but it was fastened quite firmly to the ground. They're growing, said Co. Did you pull them up? asked Jack. No, indeed, said Co. They must have pulled themselves up, said Jack. Yes, said Co, that's it. They grew so fast, they pulled themselves right up. Then Jack sprinkled earth over them until he could not see them and went away in two or three days they were all on top of the ground again well 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 said jack they don't know anything to keep unplanting themselves that way but now he could not pick up any of the beans without tearing loose the stout little stem with roots at the end that had gone down into the ground you bean he said tapping one on its green head for they had grown very green now you bean i shall plant you deep enough this time you will die and not grow at all if you don't stay still in the ground at this the bean smiled a bean cannot smile you say oh well that is what nearly every one would say but i can tell you a great many people do not know about beans and i am sure that bean smiled if i did stay still in the ground how could i grow asked the bean you think beans cannot talk well as i said before a great many people do not know about beans and whether they can talk or not this bean asked jack how it could grow if it stayed still in the ground and what is more jack was stumped as the boys say by the question and could not answer of course nothing that stayed perfectly still could grow but why don't you send up a little stem and let the bean that i planted stay planted asked jack well, i'll tell you said the bean and if by this time you do not believe beans can talk you may as well not read another word of this story talking beans are just as true as cinderella or hop o my thumb or little red riding hood or jack the giant killer and those people of course everybody knows how true they are so jack's bean said i will tell you and then asked are your hands clean they are fair to middling said jack looking at his hands and for the first time in his life wishing he had washed them oh well said the bean if they are not sticky it won't matter i am going to let you look at me but i don't want you to pull me apart either on purpose or by accident i won't said jack well then very gently open this green part that you planted when it was white and that won't stay under the ground and look and jack did so 
he found the green part was split in two halves and right between the halves fastened at the end where the root went down were stowed away two pretty green leaves my said jack well i guess so said the bean rather proudly you see i have these little leaves packed away even when i am white but then they are also white and very very small you very likely would not even see them at least not with your own eyes you would see something if you knew where to look but you would not see two leaves without the help of a magnifying glass but i know they are there all the time bean section two tell me more said jack he thought it the jolliest thing in the world as it certainly was to have the beans talk to him the bean was as pleased as he was for it liked to talk and it could not always find so good a listener so it said i keep my two white little leaves very closely packed away between my two big hard white cotyledons your two big hard white what said jack cotyledons my said jack yes cotyledons you probably did not know there were two you thought it was just one mass of white stuff probably you did not know my cotyledons had a coat either yes said jack i knew that it tears open when you grow and i knew you split in two only i didn't know you called yourself cotyledons and we don't said the bean with a funny little laugh but it is no matter what we call ourselves grown-up men call our seed leaves cotyledons i would rather know what you call them said jack oh i can't tell you that nobody can but why don't you ask me what i mean by my seed leaves i think you mean the two halves that come apart with the two little leaves between them said jack yes so i do but there are more than two leaves between there is a little end that grows down and makes a root yes said jack i know hush said the bean you don't know anything about it you mustn't tell me you know you must just keep on asking me about myself you are cross said jack oh i'm not said the bean i am only right well what should i ask demanded jack stupid if you have nothing to ask i have nothing to tell you so good-bye oh don't beg jack i will ask and ask and ask only don't stop telling well ask away said the bean what makes you turn green what makes you so hard before you're planted how do you know when it's time to wake up where do just hear the boy interrupted the bean asking a dozen questions and not waiting for an answer to any of them oh, why don't you stop to take a breath why said jack now you can answer a long time there's something in that returned the bean and i will tell you about turning green you turn green i don't said jack don't interrupt i turn green because i cannot digest my food unless i do and how am i to live without food even you could not live if you could not digest your food i'm glad i don't turn green when i digest my food said jack and then asked what do you eat there you go again another question and the first set not answered yet i get my food from the air and the earth i am fond of gas and when i turn green i can digest it you know the air is nothing but gas well i can eat air i'm glad i don't have to said jack thinking of chocolate pudding oh of course you prefer much coarser things but don't interrupt i am fond of air and the little leaves that i have stowed away need much food so i just grow up to the top of the ground where there is to be found air and sunlight and then i let my two little leaves draw all the good out of my cotyledons they have air too and water and the roots send them food but they eat all the good out of my cotyledons as well and that is why they grow so fast look there see that bean plant over there 
the cotyledons are all withered and look like dry leaves that is what they are just dried leaves that's the way mine will look some day but i don't care for more leaves will grow above the first two and i shall have plenty of stem and many leaves and after a while beautiful flowers will come and then lots of new seeds will grow from my flowers you see how it is don't you i am just the bean baby you are a great talker for a baby said jack oh yes you can't understand that of course but as i said before some people do not know about beans you say that pretty often said jack but the bean only laughed and replied well it's true whether you like it or not beans section three can you tell me about peas jack asked the bean the next day i planted some and they stayed in the ground perhaps i can the bean replied but they are different from us and i have told you enough well i suppose after what you have told me i can find out something about peas for myself said jack oh of course you can replied the bean some people never know anything because they cannot find out without being told good-bye said jack politely i am very much obliged to you but the bean was not so polite as jack for it did not answer at all perhaps however that is the polite way among beans jack was still thinking about beans when he went into the house and saw a pan of dried lima beans soaking for dinner he took one up and slipped it out of its white jacket and it fell apart in his hand so that he saw quite plainly the little plant packed away at one end it must like water better than i do to swell itself that full said he to himself for the soaked beans were about twice as large as the dried ones couldn't grow a bit without it said jack's bean in a cross voice popping from between his fingers back into the pan of water we have begun to grow we have in spite of its crossness jack felt a little sorry that it was to be eaten for dinner instead of growing in some damp and lovely place but he thought and no doubt he was right maybe among beans it doesn't matter if they are eaten i don't know beans he added screwing up one eye why do we eat beans he asked his father at dinner because they are nearly all starch and starch is good food his father replied does the baby bean eat starch jack asked oh yes his father said the baby bean grows on the starch stored up in the bean the little plant is stowed away in one corner of the bean and lives on the starch of the cotyledons when it first begins to grow oh, yes i know that said jack but don't you think it is rather hard on the bean for us to eat it no his father replied there would not be room for all the beans to grow some would have to die anyway and if the bean could understand i am sure it would be very glad to give us food perhaps it does understand said jack thoughtfully beans are great thinkers if that is so said papa smiling they must be a little proud to know that all the animals depend upon the plant life for food i don't see how that is said co well i will tell you said his father plants can eat gases and other minerals yes i know that said jack remembering what the bean had told him about it they change these things into plant material his father went on and people who cannot eat earth and air eat the plants and so all are able to live but we might live on meat said jack but what makes meat asked his father what do the animals we use for meat live on plants jack replied nodding his head to show he understood yes plants and so first or last all the animals depend upon the plants for their lives if we keep on we shall know beans co said to jack in a very sleepy tone of voice that night but jack tucked up in his crib was already in the land of nod End of chapter one Chapter Two of Seed Babies by Margaret Warner Morley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sweet peas. 
"'You don't seem to have to come out of the ground to get started,' Jack said to his sweet peas one day. "'Oh, no,' was the reply. "'But why? Don't you need air and light?' "'Yes, but we have enough food stored underground to start us, and, as a matter of fact, we prefer to lie still and let our clean, fresh leaves go out into the world.' "'Do garden peas act the same way as sweet peas?' asked Jack, very much awake by this time, to what was going on in the garden. "'Yes,' the sweet pea said, in a voice as musical as a summer brook. "'Yes, the garden peas are our cousins, our country cousins, as it were. They grow in the same way we do, and we are very fond of them.' "'Do you have a baby in your seed, too?' demanded Jack, sitting down cross-legged on the ground to have a good, comfortable chat with his new friends. "'My seed is a baby pea,' was the reply. "'Between my two round cotyledons you can see the rest of the infant tucked away, ready when warmth and moisture come, to spring up and grow into a vine.' "'Yes, that's so,' Jack said slowly, then added, ain't you afraid to stay out in the garden all night it had come over him all of a sudden that he would be very much afraid do you mean aren't you afraid asked the pea politely but a little severely yes said jack half a mind to rebel against having to correct bad grammar out of school but not wanting to offend the pea either aren't you afraid no i am not afraid we plants love the night-time. We can see as well as in the daytime. Jack wanted to ask if they could see at any time without eyes, but feared it might be considered impolite. The pea replied to his thought, Not as you see, but we have a way of knowing about things that you see. I cannot explain how it is, for you are not a pea and could not understand. Can you hear? asked Jack. And not as you hear, but we have a way of knowing about things that you hear. I cannot explain how it is, for you are not a pea and could not understand. Can you smell or taste or feel? persisted Jack. Not as you smell or taste or feel, but we have a way of knowing about things that you smell and taste and feel. I cannot explain how it is, for you are not a pea and could not understand. I don't seem to know peas either, muttered Jack to himself no you don't know about peas if you did you would know more than the president of the united states and the principal of your school put together my said jack you never will know all about peas the pea went on you can know a good many things about them as well as about other things that will be good for you if you keep your eyes open and your brain working how they all like to teach a feller thought Jack, as the pea settled down as though through talking. "'Teach a fellow,' said the pea, rousing up. "'Teach a boy would sound better yet.' "'Teach a boy,' corrected Jack meekly, and then walked off and found Co and told him all the pea had said. "'You dreamed it, you silly,' said Co, with a very fine air, for he was two years older than Jack and sometimes liked to remind his brother of this fact. "'You dreamed it.' and anyway tain't polite to listen to what people think no said jack politely but a little severely just as the pea had said it to him it isn't polite but then that may be polite among peas you don't know peas you must remember that end of chapter two chapter three of seed babies by margaret warner morley this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Peanuts. Tell you what, said Co, there is a baby in this peanut. Jack looked, and sure enough, flattened down in one corner of the peanut for safekeeping, and looking very much like the bean baby, was a young peanut baby. Let's plant it, said Jack. It's been roasted, said Co. You don't suppose a roasted baby would grow, do you? no said jack i'm afraid it wouldn't let's ask father father says to plant it and see jack said running back a few minutes later he says he'll get us some raw ones in town tomorrow and we can plant both kinds of course it would be silly to plant a roasted one said co why would it asked the peanut in his hand oh because it would was the wise reply you're dead you know said jack 
and dead things can't grow. Am I dead? Then how can I talk? It is talking, said Co, very much surprised, as soon as he stopped to think about it. Anything can ask questions, whether it is dead or alive, said Jack and a very wise speech it was though you who do not know as much as you will if you live to be wiser may not think so why can't i grow repeated the roasted peanut well can you asked co no i can't now answer my question why can't i i don't know said co meekly it's time you found that out said the peanut snappishly it is so easy for you to say a thing is so or isn't so and all the time you don't know anything about it i hope you're cross enough said co firing up but jack said never mind co the poor thing has been roasted if you had been roasted so you couldn't ever grow you might be cross too me roasted i'm not a peanut said co indignantly if you knew as much as you never will know, you would understand that there is not such a great difference between us as you think, said the peanut grimly, and as to being roasted, that is by no means the worst thing that could happen in the world. What would be worse? asked Jack curiously. I cannot tell you. You would not understand, said the peanut. They all seem to think alike about our understanding, said Jack yes said co they think they know everything end of chapter three chapter four of seed babies by margaret warner morley this librivox recording is in the public domain melons and their cousins where did you get it jack asked as he went into the yard and found co with a slice of ripe watermelon in his hand mother gave it to me there's one for you, he said, pointing to another slice on a plate in the grass. Save the seeds, said Co. Then for a few minutes nothing was to be heard but a funny little juicy sound. And when this ceased, what do you think? There was nothing left of the watermelon but just the rind and some flat black seeds. Co handed a seed to Jack. What shall I do with it? asked Jack take off its jacket said co speaking as though he thought jack a little deaf so jack took the melon seed and peeled off its tough black coat now take off its shirt said co and jack slipped off a delicate silky covering now look inside ordered co see said jack as he did so the melon seed had fallen into two parts in his hand just like the bean and there in one end was the baby plant lying close to the cotyledons do you suppose it would grow asked jack of course it would said co how do you know i would asked the melon seed well wouldn't you asked co he was used to stopping jack's questions this way when he could not answer them and had not yet learned the difference between jack and a logical vegetable yes i would said the melon now answer my question how do you know i would because said co confidently melon seeds generally do do they how many of those you planted came up co blushed you see you don't know anything about it if you cared to be wise you would find out how i grow if you could then you would know why i don't grow and how to help me that is so said co and some day when i have plenty of time i mean to find it out if i can let's go to the garden now and see if we can find out anything about it said jack i know where there are some jolly big melons all right said co and off they went but they did not stay long the melons just lay on the ground and said not a word stupid things come along said co so they went along and the first thing jack did was to step on a ripe cucumber ouch he cried and co laughed then jack said let's make boats 
Of course, I'm not going to tell you what they did then, because everybody knows. They just took cucumbers and cut them open lengthwise and scraped out the insides and whittled out sticks and stuck them in for masts and pinned on paper sails. They sailed their boats on the duck pond, and most of them turned over and some sank, for the wind blew, and Co said there was a gale on. If you think it is easy to make cucumber boats sail in a high wind, or in any wind, or in no wind, you just try it. Cucumber boats do not like to sail. Jack put a lot of seeds in his pocket. They were rather damp and sticky, but then a boy's pocket expects such things. When the whole fleet had come to grief, the boys sat on the edge of the pond, and Jack pulled a handful of seeds out of his pocket. Do you suppose these are seed babies? he asked, holding one in his fingers. Easy enough to find out, said Co, splitting one open with his fingernail. Yes, there it is, a cucumber baby tucked up in the corner. Do you suppose all seeds are babies? asked Jack, following Co's example and splitting one open. I shouldn't wonder, said Co. Cucumber seeds and melon seeds are just alike, only the cucumbers are small and white, said Jack. We're cousins, piped up the seed. What makes your cousins have black seeds, then? demanded Co. Won't tell, screamed the seed. You've spoiled me, and I'm mad. Go ask the pumpkins why they have white seeds. They are cousins, too, and maybe they will tell you, but I won't. I'm sorry I spoiled you, said Co. Oh, it doesn't really matter, muttered the seed. There are so many of us, we can't all live. And perhaps I'd rather be spoiled by you than just dry up or rot in the ground. Poor thing, said Co. Then added, but I'll tell you what we'll do, Jack, when the pumpkins get ripe. I know, said Jack. And of course you know, so I won't tell you for anything how they took a pumpkin when it got ripe and cleaned all the insides out and cut a lovely new moon of a mouth in it with scallops for teeth. And I won't tell you how they made round holes for eyes and a wedge-shaped hole for a nose. And I never will tell you how they put a lighted candle inside and set it on the gate post one dark night to show their father the way in and how the telegraph boy came instead with a message and was frightened almost out of his senses he was a city boy and not used to jack-o'-lanterns of course co and jack made the acquaintance of the pumpkin seeds and you know as well as i do how they found the pumpkin babies tucked away in one corner so I won't say a word about it. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Seed Babies by Margaret Warner Morley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Nuts What did you say about nuts for dinner? asked Jack one day. I said we were going to have them, replied Co. It must be almost dinner time, said Jack, and sure enough, just then the dinner bell rang. There is a baby in this almond, I do believe, said Jack, as he cracked his first nut after dinner had been eaten and the nuts passed. It's like a bean, said Co. Beans are seeds, said Jack. If you plant them, they will grow. So are nuts seeds, added Co. If you plant them, they'll grow. Then there must be babies in the nuts, said Jack, for it's the little seed babies that grow up and make big plants. Let's look for them in all the nuts, said Co. Then added, Mother, can't we take our nuts on the porch and eat them? Of course you may, said Mother. So off they went, their nuts in their pockets. Now, said Co, looking very wise, you see these almonds grow on trees, and they have to fall a long way, and they might get bruised, so their coat is hard like wood. Do you suppose that's the reason they're so hard? asked Jack. It's as good a reason as any, said Co.
yes said the almond that is the way too many people reason without taking the trouble to find out the real truth about things well why are you hard asked ko i won't tell you said the almond who though naturally good-natured had been made very cross by ko's poor reasoning i won't tell you because then you would never know why i am hard wouldn't i know if you told me asked ko opening his eyes in astonishment no that's the very reason you would not know nobody knows from being told if you think about it as long as you live and don't ask anybody's opinion you may find out it's the only way we'd need more than one brain wouldn't we if we learned everything everybody tells us to asked jack no you wouldn't said the almond one brain isn't much to be sure but if you knew enough to use it instead of holding it open like a big-mouthed meal-bag with a hole in the bottom for somebody to pour things into you would get on very well and be as wise as would be good for you let's not eat any more almonds said jack they are so cross to us oh no said ko they taste good and if we eat them fast and chew them hard they can't scold at us yes that's the way people do about everything said the almond with a sigh as it disappeared in jack's mouth do you think it will keep on talking after i've swallowed it he asked in alarm oh i guess not said ko look here he had cracked a madeira nut and taken the meat out whole i don't see any baby there said jack don't be too sure about that said ko carefully pulling his nut apart look there in the corner isn't that a baby but it lies in crosswise not straight like the others it's so crumpled up you can't tell much about it said jack that's it said the nut i am crumpled i am not smooth and simple like your bean but here i am all folded up so you have to look at my cotyledons a long time to find out how i really split open to grow how do you asked ko plant me said the madeira nut the boys planted half a dozen in the garden and dug one up every day to see how it was getting on they gave it plenty of water and one day what do you think the shell had split open oh ko screamed jack just look in the crack how white it has got they planted it again and in a day or two out of the crack peeped a little green sprout from the place where the two crumpled cotyledons were fastened together the boys were delighted but as it would say nothing to them they planted it again and watched the stout root go down into the ground why don't the cotyledons come out of the shell asked jack of ko one day the nut answered what's the use in taking that trouble my cotyledons are all folded in the shell so that it would not be easy for them to get out besides i am so very sweet that i might get eaten if i came out i just stay in the shell and let my leaves and roots out they are fastened to me you see and can draw out all the food they need you see my cotyledons are changed yes they are quite soft and greenish yellow said ko pulling off a piece of the shell there there now let me alone to grow in peace said the nut thinking investigations had been carried far enough but jack and co did not let it alone they made it tell them a great many things about itself and the great secret of how it was folded not at all as it looked to be but if you want to know these things you must go and plant some madeira nuts for yourself and keep them moist if they are fresh some will be sure to sprout and if you are as bright as i think you are they will tell you all that ko's and jack's nut told them End of chapter five
Chapter Six of Seed Babies by Margaret Warner Morley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. More about nuts. Of course, Co and Jack did not stop there. They asked all sorts of nuts about themselves and came to the conclusion that every nut was a seed baby that only needed a good chance to wake up and grow. Only some things puzzled them a great deal. One was the hazelnut that did not seem to have any place to split open like the rest and the hazel only laughed at them and would not tell them how it got out of its shell they thought it must be a baby for when they cracked it there were the two little leaves and the tiny stump of a root ready to grow just like the other seed babies and of course if it were a baby it would have to get out of its shelly cradle some time but it would not tell how nor am i going to tell any tales out of school nor in school either if you want to know you will have to do as jack and co did plant it and keep it moist i can tell you this much jack and his brother were considerably older as well as wiser before they finally discovered the hazelnut's secret but they did not give up until they had discovered it which i hope is exactly the way you will behave another thing that puzzled the boys was the brazil nut they puzzled over that a long time they couldn't make up their minds that it was a seed baby at all but if not what was it they planted it and one day when they were considerably older and wiser it began to grow of course then they knew or thought they knew it was a seed baby but never could they find in the brazil nut any sign of the little plant as they had found in the other seeds i think said jack one day that it is not a seed baby at all for it hasn't told us anything huh said the brazil nut you had better keep still jack it will begin to tell you you don't understand said co warningly well said the brazil nut i might tell you that and tell the truth but it would be too much trouble i prefer to talk about myself i grow in the forests of brazil where it is the hottest summer all the year round and i grow on a very tall and very handsome tree twenty or thirty of us grow together in a cup that looks something like a coconut we fill the space so full and are so nicely fitted together that if any one unpacks us he can never put us all back again some of my cousins have lids to their cups and these lids fall open when the cups get ripe and drop from the tree and let the nuts fall out these are called monkey cups because the monkeys that live in the forest where we grow like to play with them my cup has no lid however but is apt to break in its fall from the tall tree or else we have to lie and wait and wait for that hard cup to get soft in the wet ground we can swell i tell you when we get ready to grow our shell is not so very hard for it has soaked until it is rather soft and we just press against it and burst it open there said co i believe that is the way the hazelnut does it hazelnut i don't know anything about hazelnut but that is the way we get out of our shell but where do you keep your baby asked jack keep my baby why you goose i am all baby i am just a baby a seed baby and nothing else but i can't see your two leaves and your little root even when i look with papa's glass said co oh well i am not going to tell you all my secrets i know how it is and if you want to you will have to find out how can we find out asked jack that is your lookout was the reply and not another word could that nut be got to say then or after end of chapter six Chapter Seven of Sea Babies by Margaret Warner Morley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cradles. 
why do you suppose nuts and things have such dreadful coverings jack asked co one day after he had spent half an hour scrubbing his hands with lemon and salt to get the walnut stains off so he could go to town with mamma the barn floor was covered with butternuts and black walnuts and their shucks as the boys called the juicy outer covering they had made themselves each a flail such as farmers used to use to thresh out wheat and rye and had been pounding away for a day or two to get the nuts out of their shucks as threshing is generally done by machinery now a good many boys and girls have never seen a flail so i must tell you it is two strong sticks the longest one as long as your arm or longer they are fastened together with a bit of rope or leather you hold one end and with the other pound the grain or whatever you wish to loosen from its husk those who have gathered butternuts and black walnuts know what a thick juicy hull the nuts are covered with and how the juice from these hulls has a very bad taste and stains the fingers a deep rich brown which stays a long time it is very hard to remove even if one tries boys usually do not try they let it wear off jack and co generally did not trouble themselves much about it but this time jack had an invitation to go to the city with his mother to a birthday dinner with half a dozen cousins about his own age that is he could go if he could get his hands clean he knew there would be fun games and stories and plenty of ice cream so he was doing his best with a lemon and a saucer of salt and co was helping him i think said co that i know why nuts are covered up this way ever since the almonds scolded so when i said it was hard because it had to fall a good way i've been thinking about it so you see it sometimes does children good to scold them well out with it said jack who was much more interested just then in getting his hands clean than in hearing about nuts don't you remember said co the almonds uncle john sent us from california those fresh ones they had an outside covering a little like the butternuts only not so much so well you remember what the madeira nut said about not coming out of its shell it was so sweet it might get eaten now i believe that's why nuts have such a mean shuck but hickory nuts don't nor chestnuts said jack you pick them up as clean and shiny as you please ow he roared in the same breath don't rub all the skin off my fingers i guess that hand is about as clean as it can get and leave any skin on said co surveying the very red little paw which he had been scrubbing i think brown hands look about as well as red ones but mother doesn't seem to i should say hickory nuts do have bad tasting shucks until they get ripe and fall out he went on seizing jack's other hand and vigorously applying lemon and salt to the finger ends sometimes the shucks get dry and let the ripe nuts out and sometimes they stay on the nuts and fall off with them that's about it said a walnut that had rolled across the barn floor near where they were sitting you see our shells are quite soft at first and our seeds though not as sweet as when we are ripe are still pretty good to eat so we just cover the whole thing over with the bitterest stingiest rind we can manage to make and keep it until we are too hard for birds and most insects even then we walnuts keep our hulls but hickory nuts drop out of theirs and so do chestnuts chestnut burrs don't need to taste very bad said jack laughing nothing would want to bite one again after it had once got a few stickers in its mouth no indeed said co come to think of it all nuts have some sort of horrid outside to them remember how sour the hazel burr is the madeira nut doesn't said jack you can't say that said co for you don't know how it grows 
i shouldn't wonder if it has for it is ever so much like a hickory nut well brazil nuts persisted jack goodness boy don't you remember what they told you about the hard cup they grow in that's for the same thing only it is hard instead of tasting nasty it's just the way it is said the walnut from its place in the corner all of us nuts have to be taken care of while we are growing now what do you keep your babies in in their mother's arms said jack i mean when they're asleep said the nut cradles answered jack well that's the way with us these bad tasting or hard husks are just the cradles to keep our babies safe until they are strong enough to help themselves a little goodness said jack yes said the walnut that's the way it is i believe all seeds have cradles come to think of it said co for the beans have their tough pods and the peas too even the pigs won't eat bean pods how about apples demanded jack they taste bad until they're most ripe said co but then it seems just as if they asked to be eaten yes and cherries and peaches and plums and oh lots of things added jack i can tell you about that said the walnut proud of being able to tell the boys so many things you see almonds and plums are very much alike only almonds have big sweet seeds and not very hard shells now they have bad tasting husks to keep the seeds from being eaten well plums have bitter seeds and very hard shells so they have sweet and juicy hulls which birds and people like to eat but they throw away the seed which may chance to fall in a place where it can grow so with apples and pears the core is tough and keeps the seeds from being eaten it is a good thing for the seeds to be carried away from the tree where they grow and thrown in a place where there is more room for them to live there don't you think that is done jack demanded pulling his hand away from co and looking at it yes i guess you'll do now was the reply if they ask whether we took you for a lobster and tried to boil you tell them it's scrubbing and not boiling that's made you so red good-bye co said jack i'll eat an extra plate of ice cream for you but co did not look very grateful to jack's generous offer i wish they'd invited me too he said oh it's tom's birthday soon and he's your size you know and it will be your turn to go then i'll have to stay home and think about it said jack consolingly and off he went and the chapter seven chapter eight of seed babies by margaret warner morley this librivox recording is in the public domain apple seeds give me one demanded jack a few days later as he found his brother disposing of a big apple this is all i have but i'll give you a bite co replied why can't you give me half persisted jack who grew hungrier and hungrier for that apple as he saw his chances of having it diminish well piggywig i will so co cut the apple in two and in doing so cut across the core of course my said jack who had come to look much more closely at things since the seeds began to talk to him what a cunning cradle those little black babies have they are babies aren't they co those apple seeds of course said co with a very superior air how do you know rang out the apple seeds voice like a little silver bell i don't exactly said co good-naturedly i just guess so because so many seeds are just the plant's babies and then the walnut said something about it though i don't remember just what there there never mind looking pealed out the silver voice again as co took up the seed to examine it how am i going to find out demanded co oh plant me i would like that so much better than being pulled to pieces and you would learn just as much and more all right 
and Co tucked the apple seed under the ground in the corner of the garden. Well, it was a baby, for in the spring it started to grow, and Co let it alone. And after a few years, what do you think? He picked golden apples from that little black apple seed tree. I say, said Jack, watching Co plant it, what a scheme it would be to plant all the apple seeds and peach seeds and pear seeds and plum seeds and everything just plant a seed wherever there's a spot big enough for a tree i heard about a man who did that said co he planted something whenever he went for a walk he put fruit trees in the field and on the edge of the woods wherever he went the fruit trees grew people found fruit in unexpected places and were glad even when he had been dead a great many years the people picked his fruit that is nice said jack i mean to save my seeds it puzzles me about plums and things said co let's ask mother for some plums and peaches and see how they manage about their seeds i guess the stones are seeds and that they split open to let the baby out perhaps you think i'm going to tell you all that jack and co found out about pits of things but you are very much mistaken if you want to know these things as far as i'm concerned you will have to go to work and find them out for yourselves and it isn't a hard matter either anybody with a pair of eyes and any sort of mind can do it pretty well but this i will tell you that jack and co did not stop asking and looking when the next summer came and they could pick the little seeds from the outside of the strawberry and the blackberries and the raspberries and from the inside of the blueberries and the gooseberries and the currants and grapes and found these mites of seeds to be just tiny strawberry and raspberry and blackberry and currant and gooseberry babies they thought they knew something about seeds they gathered grain too that summer heads of wheat and barley and oats and ears of corn and they found them filled with grains and they said these grains were seeds and that each seed was a baby they ended up saying that every seed even the dandelion and thistledown and the tiniest poppy or turnip seed was a baby and nothing but a baby and maybe they were right about that but they did more than this what do you think they said that everything had to be grown from a seed and that there was no other way to manage it which shows how very very little they knew after all for it is one thing to say that a lily can grow from a seed but quite another thing to say it cannot grow except from a seed and right there is where they made the mistake end of chapter eight Chapter Nine of Sea Babies by Margaret Warner Morley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sweet Kitty Clover. It was Sweet Kitty Clover who found that lilies and berry bushes and some other things grow by bulbs and buds instead of by seeds. You all know Kitty. At least everybody used to know her, for there was a song about her beginning sweet kitty clover she bothers me so well it was kitty who showed jack and co the funny little black bulbs in the armpits no the leaf pits of the big tiger lily and how the sprouts that made new bushes sometimes come out of the roots of the old bushes instead of out of seeds but she agreed with the boys that a great many things in the plant world had to start from seeds she used to gather the flower seeds and soak them until they had become soft and then with her father's big magnifying glass she would look at the little plants curled up in the seeds come over here and see something she called to jack and co one morning for they were next door neighbors kitty was about half the way between jack and co in age and the three played together a great deal of the time of course the boys had told her all the things the plants had said to them this had pleased her so much that she too began talking to the flowers and other live things about her 
she used to get into mischief very often and bother people and i suppose that is what the song meant to-day she had to stay in the house because she had accidentally on purpose as the boys said walked through a puddle of water and got her feet soaking wet so there she sat wishing for something to do when she caught sight of the morning glory vines and all at once she remembered she had put some seeds to soak the day before this was just the time to look at them so she ran and got them then she called the boys for she thought she really had something worth showing jack and co came racing over at kitty's call glad of an excuse to see her for they always felt badly when she was in disgrace almost as badly as if they had been the cause of it sometimes they were the cause of it and helped her get into mischief but they were always sorry when it was too late it is so very easy to get into mischief kitty said she never had to try a bit she had to try hard to do everything else but that seemed to do itself the boys were glad to see kitty and glad to see what she had to show them everybody remembers how the morning glory looks when it first comes out of the ground two blunt little leaves appear that do not look at all like the heart-shaped ones that come later while well, kitty slipped off the black skin of the seed and inside she found packed about by some clear jelly-like material these same two little leaves as blunt as you please and all curled up in the seed that's worth seeing said co it has its food separate from its cotyledons is that jelly its food demanded jack it must be said co and kitty thought so too after a while the morning glory told them all about it and co was quite proud to learn he had guessed right the jelly is the food the morning glory said then kitty soaked a lot of four o'clock seeds and in each of them found the tender little plant with no starch to speak of stored in its cotyledons but instead lying embedded in a flowery mass of food it would take a long time to tell all the queer and lovely seed babies kitty and the boys saw in the flowers that summer they looked at wild flowers as well as those in the garden and everywhere the story was the same in the seed was stored away the plant baby they had a lot of fun doing it and anybody who likes can have just as much fun for the seeds are always ready to show their treasures End of chapter 9。Chapter 10 of Seed Babies by Margaret Warner Morley。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。A New Kind of Seed。One day Kitty came upon something funny enough. She found what she took to be a lot of round white seeds growing on the back of a leaf. I didn't know seeds grew that way, Jack said, shaking his head over them let's soak them said he so they soaked a few but when they opened them they could find no seed baby only something soft and without any form at all how co laughed when he found what they were doing you precious pair of ninnies he roared well what ails you demanded jack indignantly oh my goodness soaking eggs to make them grow gasped co eggs nothing of the sort retorted jack but co was right as time proved for one day out of these little seeds as jack and kitty persisted in calling them there came creeping the very funniest and tiniest of caterpillars i told you so said co seeds and eggs are the same thing anyway said jack coolly yes katie hastened to add the very same thing only little plants hatch out of seeds and little animals out of eggs there must be something in that co admitted you a seed baby jack demanded very gently poking one of the little caterpillars that had already gone to work to eat the edge off the apple leaf upon which it had been hatched but if it was a seed baby it did not say so it just rolled up into a ball and fell off the leaf on the ground you've lost it screamed kitty it lost itself protest jack and anyway 
I guess that kind of seed baby can take care of itself, even if it is lost. They don't seem to have to be very old to do that. The children were so anxious to keep their little caterpillars that Kitty's mother gave them a piece of netting, which they tied over the branch where the caterpillars were, and so all summer the two boys and Kitty watched them grow. Only Kitty's father said they must be sure that none of them escaped, for he didn't want his whole orchard eaten up by them. How they do eat, said Co, as he removed them for the third time to fresh branches, because there were no leaves left on the old ones. Their skins are falling off, Jack exclaimed one day, and sure enough it was true. They crawled out of their skins plumper and bigger than they were before. They got too big for their skins, said Kitty. It's a handy way to grow, Jack said. You just fill up your old skin, then pop it open and creep out with a brand new and bigger one on you. When they had changed their skins a number of times, and had grown many times as large as they were at first, all the caterpillars spun soft cocoons and closed the doors behind them. When winter came, Katie carried those little cocoons into the house, and towards spring out came not the caterpillars, but in their place bright little millers. I must say, Jack remarked, those were queer seeds you found, Kitty. And I must say, added Kitty, that the butterflies take a roundabout way to get here. They're not butterflies, said Jack. They're millers. It's about the same thing, Smarty, Kitty retorted. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Seed Babies by Margaret Warner Morley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bumblebees If anybody were to suppose that Kitty and Co. and Jack were satisfied with caterpillar eggs that summer, right dares where he broke his molasses jug, as Uncle Rumus would say, for they took to hunting eggs just as they had been hunting seeds before, and if they didn't find as many eggs as they did seeds, at least they found a good many. And although they could not find the baby caterpillars and ants and flies and bugs in the eggs when they broke them open, if they watched them long enough without breaking, the little creatures were sure to grow and hatch out of them sooner or later. Everything lays eggs, I believe, Jack said one day. Do you suppose bumblebees do? asked Kitty. Then added very mysteriously, I know where there's a bumblebee's nest. How do you know it's a nest? demanded Co. Oh, because, said Kitty. Huh, said Jack. That's no reason. Well, I know it is, and if you want to get it, I'll show you where to find it, said Kitty. Come along then, said Co. So they went with her to a place in the corner of the orchard where an old plank was lying in the grass. There, it's under that, she said, pointing to the plank. The boys looked, and presently a big bumblebee came blundering out of a hole at the edge of the plank. Well, I believe it's so, said Co, and then added, Now, you had better run, Kitty, for I'm going to lift up that plank. You don't dare, said Kitty. You'll see if I don't, he replied proudly. Now run, or you'll get stung. Who's afraid, demanded Kitty, standing her ground. I'm not going to run. You'll get stung, said Jack warningly. So will you, retorted Kitty. Oh, boys don't mind such things, said Co with a very fine air. Neither do girls, replied Kitty, obstinately. Well, get stung if you want to, said Co suddenly, seized one end of the plank and raised it a little. It was too heavy for him to move much, but the little he did stir it sent out a swarm of very lively and very angry bumblebees. There's one on your apron, Kitty, yelled Jack, dancing around and fighting a bee that seemed determined to make his acquaintance. I know it, Kitty screamed back, trying hard not to cry and putting her hands behind her while the bee came buzzing up her apron. But for some reason it tumbled off and she was saved. Just then Co darted past her, making some very queer noises as he went. 
boys don't mind such things naughtily katie called out running after him and then jack passed her bawling as if he were being killed boys don't kitty began but just then something struck her on the cheek and she nearly fell over it hurt so and then something equally dreadful happened to the back of her neck and she followed co and jack bawling as loudly as they kitty's mother put something on all the stings to take out the pain and then got a book about bees and showed the children pictures of how they make their nests and showed them a picture of the dainty little rooms where the eggs are stored away it's just a bee cradle said jack studying one carefully yes that's it said co i wish we could have seen them said kitty wistfully it was mean of the bees not to let us they were afraid you would spoil their nest and kill their young ones mother replied you can hardly blame them for defending themselves suppose some great giant came to tear our house down and carry off baby bell to look at her under a microscope what would you feel like doing i'd chop his head off said jack promptly that's the way the bees felt about it said mother only they couldn't chop our heads off so they stung them off said kitty solemnly caressing the great lump on her cheek i hope you've got cheek enough kitty said co tormentingly well my eye isn't swelled shut anyway she replied looking straight at the spot where co's merry brown eye had gone into eclipse i know one thing she added boys make as much fuss as girls after all and girls hate to get stung as much as boys do added jack i know another thing put in co i think i'm acquainted with a boy who won't look for bumblebee eggs again until he learns a better way to do it end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of Sea Babies by Margaret Warner Morley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Frogs. Such lots of queer eggs as Kitty and Co and Jack found that summer and the next. Once started, looking for eggs, they found them everywhere. Even in the winter, they found spiders' eggs in the cellar, and the boy's father told the children about the grasshoppers' eggs lying in the ground, where the mother grasshopper had laid them all ready to hatch into little grasshoppers once the spring came we'll be on hand when spring comes jack said and sure enough they were and about the first thing they found were the frogs eggs in the ponds these eggs were little round balls about as big as peas dark colored on one side and a dozen or more encased in something that looked like colorless jelly the children put some of these egg masses in a jar of water and watched them after a while they hatched into tadpoles or pollywogs as the children called them i wonder why things don't hatch right out instead of hatching into something else first kitty said as she looked at them i wonder too said jack butterfly eggs make caterpillars fly eggs make maggots beetles eggs make grubs frog eggs make pollywogs and after a while the caterpillars turn into butterflies and the maggots into flies and the grubs into beetles and the pollywogs into frogs it's an awfully topsy-turvy sort of way to do but they all come out right in the end said kitty i'm going to keep my eye on these fellows said jack looking into the jar of pollywogs and see them get their legs there's one already got his hind legs said kitty pointing to a black little pollywog and sure enough he was the proud possessor of two very tiny legs it was not long before they all had hind legs and a right merry time they had swimming about with their stout little tails with their new legs to help them i believe their front legs come out of these little pockets where the gills are jack said one day it seems to me i can see them in there i believe you're right said co and he was for one day out of those very same openings there slipped the little forelegs i tell you they're getting a new mouth kitty declared one day the boys laughed at this but they laughed too soon 
for the pollywogs were getting new mouths their old mouths which were just little round openings by means of which they greedily ate the bread crumbs and bits of meat the children fed them disappeared and fine wide frog mouths opened in another place nose openings appeared too and finally the tails began to shrink it was not long after this that the pollywogs lost their tails entirely they just shrank and shrank until no tails were left and in short the brown pollywogs turned into little green frogs one of them's dead the biggest one too cried kitty one morning sure enough the little thing was lying on its back in the water i think it is drowned said mother coming at kitty's cries to see what had happened drowned exclaimed all three children for the boys always came over the first thing after breakfast to look at the pollies as they called their pets yes said mother it seems strange at first but you must remember that frogs have lungs like ours and breathe air they go under water and sometimes stay a good while but after all only as long as they can hold their breath when they want to breathe they have to come to the top now these little fellows as long as they are pollywogs breathe with gills like fishes but when they turn into frogs they lose their gills and get lungs this water is very deep for them and this one which has turned wholly into a frog was not able to stay on top long enough to get all the air it needed you will have to put them in a shallower dish and put in some stones so they can come out when they get ready poor little thing said kitty laying the froggy on its back on her hand i'm going to try monia that brings people to sometimes and maybe it's only in a faint so she got the ammonia bottle and held it to the froggy's nose well what do you think happened froggy's leg jerked kitty was so excited that she spilt a drop of ammonia on one little foot this made froggy jump in earnest and pretty soon he was sitting up winking his throat as jack said just like any grown-up frog he soon recovered from his drowning but the ammonia had hurt the tender little foot so that it never grew quite right and when he had grown to a big fellow and ate as many flies and other insects as the children could get for him he always had one game leg as co said in memory of the time when he was nearly drowned that is a true story every word of it and if you want to have some fun my wise little readers i advise you to get some frogs eggs next spring for yourself you can watch the legs come out and the nose and the mouth appear only be careful not to drown your froggies when they get through being tadpoles and be sure to feed them and be very sure to keep them in plenty of fresh water from the start otherwise they will die End of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of Seed Babies by Margaret Warner Morley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Other eggs. When you once begin to look for things, you can always find them. Kitty and the boys saw many eggs that spring besides frogs' eggs. They found a lot of turtle eggs, for one thing, and even some snake eggs. And the good old sun hatched these eggs with its warm rays just as well as if he had been their mother. The turtles and snakes did not hatch their own eggs. My, no, they left that for the sun to do. They did lay them in the warm sand, though, where the sun could get to them, and there the children found them, and left them, and went very often to see them. But do you think they saw the little turtles and snakes? Not a bit of it. They forgot all about them, for a few days when they went to look and found it was all over with and only a lot of empty shells left they nearly cried they were so disappointed every little turtle and every little snake had gone off about its business and they could not find one though they searched a long time they found fishes eggs too under the stones in a little stream that ran through the meadow near their house 
and these they really did watch hatch into little fishes for co built a wall of stones about the place where the eggs were loose enough to let the water run in and out but tight enough to prevent the little fishes from getting away that summer too the boys and their parents went to the seashore to stay three weeks and took kitty with them there was wading and bathing and swimming and sailing and in the course of their wading and sailing the children found many curious things what pleased them as well as anything they found the eggs of many strange creatures they found that starfish and sea urchins lay eggs but what surprised them most of all they learned that seashells lay eggs at least the animals that live in the shells do and such queer cradles as some of these eggs had those of the conch shell were long lines of flat cases like pods jack said and in these pods were the tiniest little conch shells so very little that they had to look through the magnifying glass to really see them and sharks eggs safe in their tough black cradles with long tendrils at the four corners they lay the tendrils they were told fastened the sharks eggs to the weeds and things at the bottom of the sea so they wouldn't be dashed about by the waves and the baby sharks could have a chance to grow in safety i don't see why such ugly things as sharks that sometimes eat people up need have their eggs so well cared for kitty said one day everything's eggs are cared for jack said and i believe almost everything lays eggs too everything that's alive has come out of an egg or a seed i believe said co and he wasn't so very far wrong End of chapter 13、Chapter、of Seed Babies by Margaret Warner Morley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Birds' eggs. Of course, with all their egg and seed hunting, the children did not forget the birds. They had chickens and pigeons to watch, and there were all the wild birds to build nests for them. A great many birds built in their yards, because the birds seemed to know they would be safe there. Of course, the children often went and looked into the nests where they were low enough so they could. But they were careful about it and never handled the eggs or the young birds. The old birds seemed to know they had just come to visit and treated them quite politely. The catbird that had its nest in the lilac bush, though, was sometimes rather cross and would fly at them and scream. I must reason with that catbird, Kitty said. So she sat down and reasoned with it. And the children thought it behaved rather better after that. For myself, I have no doubt it did. Oh, mummy, mummy, the nest is full of little kitten birds, baby Belle cried out one day. She was getting to be very much of a talker, and was also very much interested in watching the birds and things with the other children. Sister Kitty ran to look, and sure enough, there were three little dots of cat birds. The man who took care of the garden had lifted Baby Bell up so she could see them. I wonder what is in it, Jack said that same day as he held a little box in his hand that the postman had brought. It had his name on it, and he felt very proud. I can tell you. Why don't you open it? demanded Co. You go call Kitty, and I will, he said. So Co got Kitty to come, and then Jack opened the box. It was from Uncle John, who was then in Florida. He had heard about the boy's interest in looking for eggs and had sent them, guess what? A long white alligator's egg. Think of an alligator coming out of a little thing like that, said Kitty. No worse than that old rooster coming out of a little hen's egg, said Co, firing a chip at the rooster, who merely flapped his wings and crowed in reply. But an alligator is as big as a big man. And ever so much bigger, Kitty objected. Not when it is hatched, persisted Co. No, and then it's all so queer about eggs anyway, admitted Kitty. They do hatch out some queer things. I wonder if angleworms come out of eggs too, Jack said. 
as a robin hopped across the path with a fine fat angleworm in his beak. No doubt of it, said Co, and to be sure there was no doubt of it. He went and asked his father, who told him some very interesting things about angleworms' eggs. But I am not going to tell you what it was, for there are a few things I should like to leave for you to find out for yourselves. Only this I will say. If you look in the right place, at the right time, you no doubt will be able to find any quantity of angleworm's eggs, and you can watch them hatch out too if you know how to go about it. Perhaps the angleworms will tell you how that is, but I am not going to. I have told you enough, as the bean said to Jack, and like Jack, I hope you will say, well, I guess I can find out some more for myself. For so you can. If you keep your eyes open and look for things, there is no end to what you will find. The more you look, the more you will want to. That's the best of it. Anybody can make beans and other things talk, and I think it is rather a shame for people not to know about beans. Don't you? End of chapter 14 End of Seed Babies by Margaret Warner Morley